uh, minutes, page one, line 23. Only two of the four corrections from last month's minutes are included. So I've given our secretary uh, some notes on that issue. And finally, this is not really a request for a change in the minutes, but <clears throat> I just wanted to ask the other board members um, if we voted to recommend expanding parking maximums for residential homes last meeting. My recollection is that we also voted to abolish parking minimums for all uses. Does anybody have notes or remember what exactly we did vote on? The minutes say that... Uh, 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 Chairman Lehner and um, Board Member McInerney. We had presented two versions of uh, the parking amendments that were going to be um, going to City Council tomorrow night. Um, the first version um, had had established minimum park, lower minimum parking requirements for affordable housing as well as um, market rate housing. The other version abolished minimum parking requirements for all use categories, for all housing categories in all zoning districts citywide. Um, the one that we're going to be recommending and the one that the Transportation Advisory Board recommended to, recommended that City Council approve was the version that eliminated minimum parking requirements across the board. Okay, so I would ask that the minutes be um, changed to reflect that. And that's it for my comments. Okay. Any other comments on the minutes? Okay, um, can I get a motion to approve? I have a motion to approve last month's minutes. Second. Great. All those, in, oops. All those in favor say aye. Okay. Um. Phil, number four, communications from staff. Great. Thank you, Chair. Phil Greenwell, Transportation Planning Manager with the City. Just wanted to go through a couple of things that are going on with staff in the city right now with transportation. So we're excited to talk to you about, um, oh, I shoot, I forgot to write down the date for Bike to Work Day. So uh, June, 26th. June 26th, early in the morning here at the Civic Center, as well as many stations around the, the city. So we're excited to, uh, to host again. I think we're gonna have some live music this time maybe. So um, come on down and get some free food pancakes, um, sausage, and orange juice, typically. Um, we just spoke about the parking code amendments to the city council coming up tomorrow, so we're excited as well to take your recommendation up to city council from last month up to them for tomorrow and talk about the elimination of parking minimums rather than the other way around. So we'll be doing that tomorrow. That'll be first reading and they get the choice of two different options. So we will, they asked us to bring back one option which was um, modified minimums for affordable housing. So we still need to bring that up because the city council did ask us to bring that forward. But we're gonna bring this one up at the same time and talk to them about your recommendation and see which one they choose. So there'll be some important stuff happening tomorrow night. Uh, one other item, kind of administrative piece we typically don't hold a meeting in July, but because we're a mid-year um, mid new board member ter term piece now, we didn't used to be, it used to always be January was our first set of board members, but we got moved to the mid-year. Um, so we're talking about moving and having a July meeting. We need to bring some other things to you in July as well, but the, the meeting would typically be on the 8th, which is very close to the 4th of July. So what we're asking is because there are five Mondays in July, if we could, if it would work with this board to move it to the 15th of July. And so we'll just put that out there and then we'll send out an email probably tomorrow and just ask and make sure that works. But I just wanted to put that out in front of you. And if there's any objections to that right away, we could kind of hear that. 
If not, we'll still put it out there tomorrow and just pull the board and make sure that we can get a quorum at least. So put that out in front of you. And then I'm going to turn it over to Jim to talk a little bit about some uh, other things going on with more engineering pieces. Good evening, board members. Jim Eckstadt, Director of Engineering Services. A um, couple of uh, just some quick updates on some of the ongoing construction projects currently underway. Uh, Boston Avenue Bridge, um, they, uh, a few weeks ago they made the changeover, so they are now working on the northern portion of the bridge. Um, we saw a uh, revised schedule today. Contractor feels he's going to be done by the end of the year. We're still questioning that, so we'd anticipate that sometime uh, maybe late winter or mid-spring next year we'll see that, uh, that all that work completed. Uh, Spring Gulch number two, phase three, is underway. They were working um, a few weeks ago on the railroad crossing. Um, they were bringing in a, uh, the concrete structures uh, and establishing the, uh, that crossing. That's the last piece uh, that remains. The rest of the concrete is pretty much poured. So we anticipate within the next few months seeing that open. Um, we're not going to do any, any uh, type of event or anything, but we will have some announcements uh, to indicate that that trail is now open. Um, the, uh, we're um, advancing our our efforts on RSVP, Resilient Saint for Rain Project, uh, which includes the uh, adjacent trail. Um, we are working on the last piece of property acquisition. Uh, when that is completed, we hope to take it to council at the end of this month. Um, that will then open the door for the Army Corps to begin their work. Uh, to They've already received or have put out a pro the project for bids. They'll then announce the receipt of the bids and then they can move forward. Um, and the next phase from sunset to the to the west, um, we are um, finishing up the RFP uh, request for proposals to hire the consultant to actually uh, start working on design. Um, you may have seen the announcement in the newspaper. We did get a federal grant of about a million dollars for that effort. Uh, we'll take it to about 30%, and then they've, uh, FEMA's indicated they'll consider us for construction dollars in the future. Um, and then we're also uh, just about final on selecting the consultant for the work at Ma on Main Street and at uh, 21st. Uh, an RFP was issued for that, and then uh, they're evaluating the proposals now just about make a decision. So we'll see that effort start for design in the near future as well. Um, one last item, um, we are going to be beginning construction on Coughlin Street. Um, we've already started clearing some of the trees out, uh, con working with a contractor to establish the schedule. Um, but May 30th, the uh, city's going to be hosting an, uh, an open house for the downtown projects. That includes Kaufman Street, uh, includes the first and main transit station, uh, the downtown hotel, and then improvements to the safety and justice building. Um, that meeting will be, um, it is a Thursday night from 5 to 7 uh, at the library. No, I thought it was the library. All right, we'll get you an email on uh, where it's going to be, because he says senior center, I'm saying the library. <laughs> okay, senior center. <laughs> That's it from communications from staff. Thank you very much. Okay, it looks like we have... Uh, Public comments um, from, uh, and I don't want to mispronounce, so Jamie, is it Simo or Simo? Simo. Can just give your name and address? Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jamie Simo, and I live at 517 Independence Drive. I'm here today as a member of Stand With Our St. Vrain Creek, a citizen action group dedicated to protecting Longmont's St. Vrain corridor and open space, to ask for your support in making Longmont's open space sales tax permanent. Our open space sales tax, which is anticipated to sunset in 2034, was passed in, 20, in 2000 and subsequently extended in 2007. The tax, which is two cents on every $10 spent, goes to help fund the acquisition, maintenance, and enhancement of open space in Longmont. If the tax is allowed to lapse, funding and maintenance of open space will have to come from the city's general fund, which means competing with other priorities. We're asking for your support in making the tax permanent because open space sales tax dollars partly go to creating and maintaining trail connections within Longmont, encouraging multimodal transportation as an alternative to cars. 
Now is the ideal time to put a permanent sales tax measure on the ballot because this is a presidential election year and there is historically more voter turnout in such a year. If the sales tax is made permanent now, this will allow Longmont's Natural Resources Department to plan ahead with a secure source of funding without the vagaries of having a potential to potentially extend the tax again. Other municipalities have made their sales tax for open space permanent, including Lafayette, Colorado, which approved the measure by an overwhelming 82% margin. Stamp has likewise seen a positive response from Longmont residents. We have over 500 and counting signatures on our appeal, which we will be presenting to City Council within the next few months. Because of the fact that this is a tax residents already pay in addition to the other points I've mentioned, we anticipate that if put on the ballot this November, it will pass by a large margin. So again, we are asking for your backing when we ask City Council to place this issue on the ballot this fall. Thank you. And I do have some brochures um, that I'll pass to uh, the recording secretary over there. Great, thank you. Okay, let's move on to the information items. Great, thank you very much. Uh, tonight, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce to you the folks from the Front Range Passenger Rail Group. One of them is Chrissy Bright, Chief of Staff, and the other, Andy Carcian, General Manager. So this time I'd ask Andy to come on up and present to you what's going on with the Front Range Passenger Rail, and feel free to pepper him with questions. <laughs> The most difficult questions you can come up with. <laughs> During, before, after, whatever you like. Thank you, Phil. Thank you all for the opportunity to be here today and to speak to you and update you on the Range Passenger Rail Project. I'll be brief. I'm going to go through some of these initial slides pretty quickly and get to the end and maybe uh, spend a little bit more time on the policies that were passed at the legislature this year and kind of talk about how those state uh, pieces of state legislation uh, impact the district. So with that said, uh, do you all have it in front of you? Good. So that we'll uh, take, oh, that's your agenda, sorry. So there we are. There we are. So with our new inner city train service is what we're talking about with the Front Range Passenger Rail. <clears throat> this is different than what we're used to normally with what we see in Colorado with the RTD rail service, which is more of a commuter rail and a light rail scenario. What we're talking about here with passenger rail is more of the Amtrak scenario like we see in the Northeast. We have uh, initial service coming up from Pueblo up to Fort Collins. The district itself does go from the northern border to the southern border. The southern portion of the district does include Trinidad, and so that will be a portion of the service that is extended in the future, as well as moving up into Cheyenne. Um, and we can speak more to that as well. And we're using the existing infrastructure with the freight rail uh, tracks that are there uh, currently. And we're mostly doing this for a variety of reasons. Mostly, though, uh, it uh, creates an opportunity for us to get the trains running sooner and then an opportunity for us to do that within an amount of money that is a reasonable ask as opposed to going to the voters for uh, billions upon billions of dollars in order to do a new right of way and lay down new tracks and whatnot. So that is a reason for that. Um, as we work forward, uh, the, the biggest the biggest benefit that I like to talk about with folks when I'm updating them around this project and the potential for this project is the connectivity and working with the variety of folks in the region and along the Front Range, some of whom are listed here, that could be uh, the future riders and you can see that the value of this project could bring up, um, you know, for the college students as well and working professionals, folks who want to go into the metro areas for uh, games and whatnot, there's a lot of opportunities for us to find and increase ridership over time. This slide gets to what I was discussing before, kind of the difference between the commuter rail and inner city rail. I think the important thing here is the higher speed as well as uh, longer station dist distances and just a longer corridor length. We're talking around 180 miles for front range passenger rail as well as speeds up to 79 miles an hour. Here's that service overview as we're kind of looking at Right now, by 2029, three daily round trips between Denver and Fort Collins, and then by 2035, six daily round trips between Pueblo and Fort Collins. 
per the statute, the implementing statute that created the district, we need to be competitive. This project with the line will need to be competitive with uh, the times, the travel times that are currently in, in um, with the uh, with the vehicles, uh, with cars going up and down I-25. So the, the future service will be competitive with uh, the, the automobile. And we're looking at, uh, and we're pulling on and having conversations and doing some financial modeling around asking around 0 0.23, 0 0.25 sales tax ask for the voters in the district uh, when we do go to a ballot. And that's about 23 cents on $100. That gets us around $275, $300 million a year. There's also the opportunity for the district to leverage um, some financing and uh, get some debt in order to finance some of the capital construction in the front, which is a normal way of, as you all know, going through an uh, infrastructure project. And then down on the bottom there, you see the nine primary locations that we've identified for the uh, first stations along the corridor. Speaking of the stations, some of the local station planning, we are currently working with local governments along the corridor to do this station level planning. Uh, we are working with Fort Collins and uh, Longmont on a federal grant right now. Also Pueblo and Colorado Springs. Huh. Loveland, I didn't say, I'm sorry, <laughs> not you all. Loveland, my apologies. Oh, you guys are good. No, Longmont is actually, we, when we work with Phil and others and we have conversations here, we use you all as a role model for how we can move forward in conversations around station area development. So you guys are the poster children. Um, and then also the federal service development plan as we're talking about, this is kind of that um, business case that we need to present to the federal government to show that we've done our homework around what it is that we are looking at. And this does um, uh, kind of speaks to all of the alternatives there in regards to route, service, ridership, the costs that are associated with uh, doing this and negotiations with the railroads, um, as well as fare structures and whatnot. All right, so I'll spend a little bit more time on this. So on House Bill, this these are three of the bills that impacted the district um, uh, that were passed over the last session. Uh, the first one, while probably not as important for the state or for the region, but it is important for the district. As you can imagine, with a district, the largest special district in the state, uh, the bill was passed, the legislature passed the bill in 21, and the district became an entity in 22, of July, tw July 1st, 22. And since then, in in uh, 2022 to 2023, we kind of did an administrative setup of the district, and we noticed that there were a variety of different cleanup that we needed to do, a variety of different things, including clarifying what the quorum is for the board, and you know, clarifying that voting members should be the ones doing the votes and not the non-voting members. Um, clarifying that the borders of the district, when the board and the district board chose one of the three route alternatives that were proposed by the prior planning processes from the rail commission. The Front Range Passenger Rail District Board chose one of those three alternatives, which now is reflective of the one that is the BNSF Northwest Rail sub that we are all used to having conversations around. Uh, one of the other alternatives was Greeley. And when you come up out of Denver, you could go, go right and you know out east up into Greeley on a UP line on the Greeley sub the board did not choose that route and so we adjusted the borders of the district to not include Weld County uh, because of that reason um, as well as other reasons frankly if we go to a ballot uh, it doesn't behoove us or the success of a ballot measure to have Weld County who doesn't get any of the service to be voting for the ballot measures as well so uh, other cleanup measures on House Bill 1012, uh, happy to talk about more of those, uh, but m more importantly, uh, Senate Bill 184 is a fascinating conversation as well. There's a two parts to this. You've probably heard about the first part. It establishes a fee on rental cars. Those dollars go to an enterprise CTIO within CDOT. Those dollars will then be utilized for future capital construction, possible financing opportunity, and leveraging those dollars <clears throat> on federal grants as well as, as I mentioned, um, opportunities for us to use those dollars to finance and get some of the capital construction so that we can show the voters that we are moving forward on this and building sightings or building stations and building some of that infrastructure that we need um, as well. Then, more importantly, uh, for the immediate conversation, 
Senate Bill 184 created the uh, opportunity for the district, RTD, and CDOT to sit down and talk about what needs to be done and who will be the responsible actors for the implementation of Northwest Rail on the corridor. Thank you. And then uh, that conversation will happen this summer, and the district is responsible for uh, engaging those two entities. We already work with these two stakeholders very closely. CDOT is the entity that is doing our service development plan, which I mentioned before. They're doing a lot of the conversations with FRA right now to figure out how best to efficiently move through that bureaucratic process. And we're also obviously working with RTD very closely. Both of those entities are on my board, on the district board, and um, when you know, we have been working with RTD around the conversation on Northwest Rail, because we knew from day one when the district was created that the path, the the path of Northwest Rail and Front Range Passenger Rail go together and the success of both I think are tied together and we want to do as much as possible to create a win-win scenario so that we are able to leverage those dollars that the taxpayers have spent in to the fast tracks account so far for those purposes that they were originally intended for that RTD passenger or I'm sorry the commuter rail line and the stations that are developed on that line in addition to passenger rail coming onto that line for a joint operations conversation what does that look like we don't know yet. That's the conversation that we're going to have this summer. And the legislature directed us to have that within the framework of everything from creating a joint powers authority, which is what California does. It's a separate entity, kind of similar, not kind of, very similar to what the district does, a singular focus with funding from local governments and other transit entities for that singular purpose of a project. Uh, more often and, and more likely we will uh, have the conversation of developing an IGA between the three entities because that's more of what we do here in Colorado and less of creating another special entity in order to have the same kind of conversation that the district is already having with CDOT and RTD. Um, there will be a report that comes out of the Senate Bill 184 conversation that we need to uh, send and present to the legislature by the end of September of this year. So this is a fast conversation. Uh, I don't want to give the impression that we are going to solve the problem of Northwest Rail and Front Range Passenger Rail by the end of September of this year. I think that would be a momentous achievement, but what we can do is create a better plan in coordination uh, with the entities that are currently working on this in order to communicate that out to the public and help the public understand what the steps are being made in order to get towards that uh, deliverable of rail uh, on the RTD and Front Range Passenger Rail services. Then on Senate Bill 230, this was a bill, this was fascinating, this was introduced maybe with five days left in the session, six days left in the session. A massive bill that creates three new funds via a new fee on oil and gas. There was an oil and gas compromise that they got rid of some of the air quality bills that had been working with the oil and gas industry or targeting the oil and gas industry. And instead they created a fee that the oil and gas will pay that fee will go into another enterprise at CDOT, the clean transit enterprise that normally was, uh, or had historically been created to do uh, uh, support electrification efforts around the state. They expanded the scope of that uh, enterprise in addition to the funding that they have. So the scope now includes uh, connectivity issues for transit uh, systems all along the, the front range as well as the state. It uh, provides for opportunities for capital construction dollars and, and uh, you know, or buying buses, buying train sets, also allows for operation funds for transit entities and for the district. And then it also uh, has 20% dedicated for, specifically for passenger rails, uh, for passenger rail needs as we move towards a ballot measure moving into the future and what those planning and operation dollars could be as a part of that. We are very excited about the money that's coming down through Senate Bill 184 as well as Senate Bill 230. We also recognize that <clears throat> there is going to be a, excuse me, <clears throat> there will be a, a delay in implementation as these enterprises get uh, used to the new scope 
CTIO with the rental fee dollars coming in for future capital construction under Senate 184. They had never done this before. This is a new area that they will be focusing on as well as, as I mentioned, the uh, clean transit enterprise as well. Uh, they're going to have to come up with a new formula, a new grant strategy and, and formula, as well as working with the industry and the um, uh, environmentalists around uh, figuring out what the fee will be. They will be doing that at the latest of October of 25. So we don't expect any of these dollars to be coming into play until probably fourth quarter or so of 2025. And I think, Mr. Chair, that is it. You guys can scan that QR code and take part of our, uh, our poll on how you would like to ride and, and use the future Front Range Passenger Rail. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Good. I'll just deflect them all to fill. I'm going to start with uh, Board Member Bennett, and then we'll just work our way around, if that works for everybody. Yes, I, uh, so I was, uh, one clarification I wanted to know with these uh, 23 cent uh, tax on $100, is that what's being proposed down the line for the ballot to be, like is that gonna be need, need to be voter approved? Yes. Okay, and um, so that's pivotal for the, um, the trajectory of being able to get to that, like uh, the three round trips by 2029. Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. Yes. Great. Um, and so we, we believe that uh, we've done a lot of financial modeling. One of the lessons learned from the Fast Tracks conversation was the level and depth of financial modeling that needs to be done ahead of time. As you can imagine, it's difficult in order to model for something that the state has never done. Right? We can, we can figure out the costs associated with a new highway project a lot easier than we can with costs associated to a, a passenger rail project. However, there are comparable corridors around the country that we drew information from, as well as work with professionals and the, the other consultants that have done this before. So to your point, the point two three kind of reflects a comfort, if you will, of the politicos as well as the planners in order to get the level of uh, tax base that we need in order to actually pay for a project, right, as we continue along, as well as the level of financing and debt so that if there's a downturn in the economy and the sales tax revenues go down, we've still got the associated debt and the financing that we can leverage for those upfront capital costs in order to kind of level out that risk over time. And so we, we kind of came up with that number um, in order uh, around that scenario in order to kind of make sure that we had enough money to build a project, but not too much money to build a project because obviously when you go to a voters and you're asking for $600 million a year and it's going to be a project paid for in three years, they're going to ask, well, what are you doing with that rest of the money? So that's just a little extra color commentary on how we got to point two three. Good to know. Thank you. And uh, with the uh, round trip time, like, have you uh, considered the times of day that the round trips are going to be in 29 and um, later? Yes, absolutely. And that's an ongoing conversation that we're really excited to, to have. It's part of the planning that's going on right now. So that level of specificity in the planning has not occurred. Uh, that's part of our service development plan. But what we have discovered is some of the initial modeling shows that up here in the northern part of the, the district, there's less of a desire for travelers and future riders to go from like Fort Collins down to Pueblo, like the whole way through. That, generally isn't going to happen most. Fort Collins to Denver, so-so. More likely from Fort Collins to Boulder and back in kind of staying within the region. Similar down south, Colorado Springs to Denver, very you know heavy traveled and, and will be a, a good ridership in the future. Pueblo to Denver, not quite as many. Pueblo to, to Colorado Springs, not as much. So it's interesting to kind of see some of the initial ridership uh, information that's coming out. Then in regards to the time of service, it's a great opportunity that we have now to develop the ridership service modeling that we have in partnership with the freight railroads who are on the board of the district in order to try and accommodate what we hear from the folks when we're talking to them around going into Denver for a Broncos game. They'd like to take a train down to the Broncos game. They'd like to have it on the weekends because we see transit ridership kind of changing more away from this traditional commuter and more towards 
students coming home on the weekends and or you know going back to school on the weekends. So nothing specific yet, still working through the planning process, but we do have some of that initial information that, that I discussed. Fair. And um, the last question I'm, I'm curious about is with the, um, I, I'm curious to know where uh, Fast Tracks plays a role in this. And I imagine that possibly like Zetapel 184 will help uh, further clarify that and that'll be further discussed after that convergence. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, Fast Tracks plays a huge part in this conversation, right? We hear from a lot of folks that the, dissatisfaction of not getting a train through the fast tracks vote continues to weigh heavily on a conversation about bringing a new train into the, the picture. The exciting thing is the taxpayers have been paying into a savings account in order to get the train from, you know, along the Northwest sub for a commuter rail train. Those dollars are still there and those dollars can be utilized for that purpose. And what we can bring if the ballot measure is successful is the opportunity for additional dollars to create those joint operations on the Northwest sub in order to create the service much earlier than just if it was fast tracks alone, which would still take decades, you know, in order to save up enough money to make it happen. Yeah, definitely. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for your time and your clarifications. Thank you. Well, thank you, Andy. Um, I have another question about the, the point two three on a hundred. Um, is that for the entire district? Yes. Okay, so in, in terms of just like, because, you know, Longmount, we've had to deal yeah. with that as well, and we didn't get service, and, and I had looked at the time frame, you know, what, 2035 for the Pueblo, Colorado Springs area. So is there ever, is there any animosity towards that of, oh, we're signing up for this, but we're getting it later? Kind of, yeah. No, they love the idea. Okay. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> there's, there's obviously messaging that will need to be done, you know, if we pass a ballot measure and before we pass a ballot measure around what the level of service, you know, can be and when it's going to be implemented. The southern board members and southern communities already have a sense that the northern portion of the district will likely get service prior to the southern district, and there's a couple of reasons because of that. Many of the reasons I just described with the fast track savings account, as well as there's a passenger rail, um, uh, I'm sorry, a freight rail company up north, BNSF, that's more amenable to passenger rail along this sub because there's capacity uh, from a, a decrease of freight traffic. So there's more room to maneuver passenger rail on the, on the existing infrastructure up here as well. Um, so those are a couple of reasons why you know, we'll probably, just through the planning process, service will start uh, sooner up north. Um, yeah, I think that answers. Yeah, no, it, well, yeah, I, I just, you know, don't want them to lose out like we have for a, a long while. So, and then I uh, can just, so we're clear, can, can you just give a brief, like what, we, we hear about rail all the time. We, we heard it, you know, we heard about from RTD, except when they came, it was more about the BRTs. Yeah. And then uh, we have the peak rail study um, and then FRPR, what's, how, how does this all relate? Yeah, no, it's yeah. a great question because, you know, when, when, when they created the district, they were also, there was a lot of conversation around RTD at the time and the governance and what they were doing with their budget back in round 21. At that time, the legislature required them to do this peak period service study. So they're completing that right now. We also need to do our service development plan. That scope for the service development plan was created just for the Front Range Passenger Rail Line. Peak period study was created just for the commuter rail line. So there needs to be that, that integration of services and that, that joint operation. So Senate Bill 184 discussions this summer will start that and create more of a framework in order for us to continue those conversations, which didn't work or didn't uh, happen before. So that will be a positive uh, aspect on that. And then I think, you know, we'll, there's a variety of different outreach and collaboration, coalition building things that we're going to have to do over the next year or two in order to break through this perception of fast tracks and, and, and that political baggage that we have along this corridor. Um, so we'll have to continue doing that as well because it is a challenge for us as we continue to message this out. Okay. And then my, my understanding, and I think you might have mentioned it, SB 230 mm -hmm. was also a, a large portion of the funds would be for fast tracks or for RTD to complete their commitment 
Yes. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So that's also part of the rail as part of the operating uh, aspect of it. Yes. So that was also part of the intent in order to try and make this a more, you know, an important <coughs> important part of the rail. <coughs> of passenger rail moving forward, and we see this in every other state. We are challenged here in Colorado because of Tabor, and we can't raise the the revenues that we want with the legislature. Virginia, for example, similar service, similar size, similar aspirations. They were able to leverage hundreds of millions of dollars in order to get access to the freight rail lines and buy their their access onto it, as well as get that service running this, you know, quicker. We need to go through different kinds of permeation, permutations, permutations here in order to make that um, same outcome possible. Yeah. And then uh, one, one last thing, and, and that's uh, also because also in this legislative session, a lot of, you know, TOD in, uh, encouraging development along transit, whether it's BRTs or rail, hopefully. Uh, do we see any do, in the planning stage, also, do we see the opportunity of what what comes first? I kind of asked this to RTD last month. You know, is the the chicken or the egg? What comes first, ridership or yeah. or or access to that ridership, and yeah. then also promoting the development? So, so what what I did talk about was uh, there's an organization called uh, if you're familiar with Urban Three, Joe Minicosi, um uh, he he's part of uh, well. Anyways, uh, he they looked at a study in Austin versus Charlotte. Uh, you know, Austin's value per acre was six hundred and fifty thousand per acre for um, tax development, and then or Charlotte value was one point three million. The difference they found is that Charlotte had more service, Austin did not, and that's among their TODs. So, yeah. so is that theory of wealth building as well as to actually encourage that development that le the legislators have just adopted, we also need access to transit. So I, it, it's yeah. it, it's a hard, you know, three three trains. You know, I'm happy for a train. Yeah. Uh, I just want more, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, excellent point. Couldn't agree with you more. I have yeah. the, you know, in the conversations that we're having around station area development, that's obviously a key component of those conversations. And what works here in Longmont is going to be a little bit different than Fort Collins, than Denver, than in Pueblo. So it's really exciting to have that level of conversation and planning with all of the communities along the corridor, not only for TOD, but for future transit connections as well. And that's also some of what 230 does, is provide that opportunity for us to really take a look holistically, that if we get this front range passenger rail, Backbone. What does that mean in order for us to increase and, and take a look at what the transit connections can be holistically, regionally wise, as opposed to this is what Longmont's going to do, this is what Fort Collins going to do. Can we make mm -hmm. those happen? No. no. Now we have a real opportunity to not only talk about TOD but also future connections. Okay. That's more. And then uh, can you mention it with Board Member Bennett? But uh, the ridership service modeling. Can you just describe a little bit what that? processes what you're asking sir i wish i could okay. uh, c dot is in the midst of it they're doing all of it i am not a modeler i don't know they come to me and they tell me what the numbers are i believe them okay i'm sorry but i'm happy to follow up with you and get you in contact with somebody that can answer the questions yeah. for you yeah i'm curious Good. thank you Good. that's it well thank you for your presentation first of all thank you um so I have a couple of questions, uh, probably three questions for you. Um, the first is, um, so right now it looks like you're just going to do three and then moving up to six, uh, what do you call um, route today? Yeah, trips. Trips, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, how, how would that look kind of moving forward, like having like 10 trips or 12 trips? Is there the opportunity to have many more trips moving forward or is that like it's limit the service bit by uh, BNSF yeah. or other um, uses for the rail line yeah great question um, we want to start off with right sizing the the round trips and so when we talk about round trips three round trips from Denver to Fort Collins would be one two three four five six so there's six trips kind of one way three round trips right so that's how just so we all understand yes there is an opportunity to expand that and, and increase it in the future i will note that 
many of the existing corridors around the country run six round trips right around it. And actually six round trips for our service here is pretty aggressive for that level of service and the ridership and, and you know us being in a region not connected to larger markets, you know, and Amtrak and long distance service and stuff like that. So we feel that the number of trips that we are proposing is in line with what we can afford, what the, the corridor can can handle with the ridership and we believe that it will increase the ridership um, as we continue along. Now in the future when we're really successful and we get a lot of the riders and all that, there can be expansions on that. Some of those expansions may involve buying more access, especially south of Denver where the freight traffic is more frequent. And so we may have to buy even more access in order to accommodate the, the railroad down there. It may get to a point to where, I don't know if this would happen, but we literally take over the railroad. Like we buy that rail infrastructure from the freight rail in order to run more passenger services. So that is an opportunity in the future, but I think that that would be a little bit further. Okay, uh, thank you. How realistic is your time goal of 2029? Well, it depends on what we're gonna do in 2029. I think, I think it can be realistic. It's tight. Right, I'm not going to lie to you. Right, we we have a service development plan that needs to be completed in order to take that next step in negotiating with the with the railroads around that 30% design on what the infrastructure is needed. We need to do the railroad modeling um, and have those conversations. So we haven't we haven't finished our service development plan yet. So sitting from where we are right now, that looks like a stretch. That's going to be really tight. We also need to pass a ballot measure. This project will not happen without us passing a ballot measure. We may be able to kind of continue along and develop some of the sightings and station planning and get to a point to that when we do develop, you know, a pass a ballot measure, we're ready to go. But all of this is, is contingent upon that, right? It's also contingent upon buying train sets. We were literally on a call earlier with Amtrak and we were talking about uh, procuring train sets and what train sets could be available. And they're talking about a 10 year time frame. So we may have everything ready to go and there's not a train set in the country possible that we could use. I think that's a bit of a stretch. I think that, that you know, where we are sitting right now, that's the case. I also know that I think it's Siemens is bringing on a new factory in order to start developing, you know, and building new train sets and there's some other ones coming out as well. So all of that is to say we think it's possible today and who knows what's going to happen tomorrow because things change very quickly. Okay. How's that for a non-answer? <laughs> so maybe. Maybe. <laughs> we are definitely hopeful and we are working towards that. Okay. I'm saying there's a chance. <laughs> are you are you <laughs> are you planning on pushing that ballot measure for this year, or is that going to be maybe next year or the year after? Because uh, funding is the big factor. It's the, it's the factor. Yeah. It's the factor. So. Um, we are we haven't made a decision yet. So the board, the district board, is the entity responsible for referring ballot measures to the to the ballots. Um, we recognize that it's late. We recognize that there's not a lot of time left this year, and in order to run a campaign, it would be a massive lift. We also know that in politics, timing is everything. So does it make sense to go to a ballot this year for a variety of reasons versus waiting two years to where we have a better opportunity to go and communicate to the you know, constituents along the corridor what it is we're doing, get further along in the planning process, deliver a more specific message to them? That's what we're balancing right now. If I had to guess now, I'd say it's about 40% we go to the ballot this year. Okay. So with having, if you do a ballot in two years, does that mean you're going to be pushing back your 2029 deadline because you're going to get the funding that much later? I don't know. Because of what happened with 184 and 230, there's possibilities that we can move that planning forward and utilize some of those dollars in order to accomplish some of those planning goals, that is the hope. So I hope not. I hope that even if we go to the ballot in 26, we'll still have an opportunity in 29 to be running some trains. Now, is it going to be going 79 miles an hour? Is it going to be the latest and greatest train set? No. 
right? But we will be able to maybe be running some trains. Like we did a demonstration train um, recently, and I don't know how many of you were able to like see it. It arrived here, and that was the ski train. We literally took the ski train off of the the route up there and brought it down here and and ran the freight tracks. That made it from Denver to Longmont. 10 minutes slower than my staffer who drove from Denver to Longmont, running at max 49 miles per hour on freight rail. So we believe that there's a real opportunity in, uh, you know, for service and com competition with, with driving in order to make that happen. It may not be the three that round trips that we're talking about. It may be one round trip in 29, but I do think that there's a, real, uh, a chance to make that happen. Okay. Um, my, uh, my last question is, um, I really like the fact that this is going to be running through all the major towns rather than having what I-25 as being the route. Um, so that really opens the door for having really good connections within those cities. Um, so I know how Longmont is working and we have our transit station being built here, but is it the other cities along the route also doing something similar, trying to like build their infrastructure around that yeah. stop and then connecting all their bus routes and everything yeah. to those yeah. points. It's, it, they're really cool the conversations that we're having. And, and it's, as you can imagine, you know, as I mentioned, Longmont, you guys are, are Phil's doing great in having the conversations with Front Range Passenger Rail on the station area development. Fort Collins is in the very beginning of that and trying to figure out where it could be. South Metro, kind of Castle Rock area is also kind of de determining where that can be because it's interesting uh, just as a little tangent right up here it's one line that goes up down there it's two lines separated by castle rock like there's a line here castle rock and a line here where do you build a station on that right if the train's coming up north and so there's those types of conversations to have pueblo it's got its beautiful train depot already there. They've done a lot of development around it. Denver Union Station, same kind of conversation. What do we do with Denver Union Station in order to build the capacity and get to through car and not just get a north to, to you know Denver to Fort Collins or Fort Collins to Denver, disembark, get back on another train, and then go down to Pueblo, right? And so there's these engineering conversations that we need to have around that. So the answer to your question is, Absolutely, unequivocally, yes, but it really depends on what the local, kind of what that flavor is and what it looks like in the local government area. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah. This is really an exciting project. As you know, we here in Boulder County have been paying our sales tax and waiting for the train to arrive for a very, very long time. Um, I have several questions. The first one, how much funding has the BNSF committed for the project? As of now, none. None? Okay. And, and I'll tell you why. It's not because of BNSF. It's because we haven't passed a ballot measure. If you were a freight railroad, why would you offer some of your funding from your business for something that hasn't been proven yet? We need to prove ourselves and bring that. But with that said, we're talking to BNSF. They're on my board. They're working with RTD on the you know the peak period study and we're getting close to 30 percent design on that that directly impacts what it is that we'll be building as well because we're not going to be you know competing sightings uh, on the the rail line so that will help move us forward so bn is contributing in their time and their efforts i just went down there to fort worth and visited with them i think two weeks ago um, and had conversations with them about next steps and all that but as far as you know pledging and dedicating money for this nothing yet Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about the business of hauling people by rail. You say that you have had conversations personally with uh, BNSF personnel. Do you get the impression that they genuinely view passenger rail as a viable business model for the BNSF in the future? Yes. And that's because uh, their coal business is diminishing? Yes. Okay. And BNSF just generally overall, like they're, they're, they're the biggest operator with um, the freight rail operator that operates with Amtrak. And so they have the most shared miles and they work with Amtrak the most in the country. Generally, they are open, uh, more open to uh, utilizing passenger rail than other railroad companies. Mm -hmm. It occurs to me that there'll be a lot of uh, taxpayer money spent on improving BNSF facilities before any passengers ride on the BNSF rails. Will the contract be structured so that 
if those improvements are made, and for whatever reasons, political or otherwise, uh, people never ride on those rails, the BNSF would refund the taxpayers' money for those improvements? Unfortunately not, no. Yeah, okay. No, so my question is, are they primarily interested right now in getting the taxpayers to fund improvements to their rails? I think I can't answer for BNSF and what their motivation is. I really can't. All right, I understand that. Uh, let's move on. How much federal funding is committed to the project yep. uh, longer term, regardless of the results of the November elections? Yeah, so as of right now, we have uh, applied for a couple of federal grants uh, in order to help fund it. We've gotten uh, included in the Corridor Identification Development Program, which was a new program that FRA set up in order to kind of funnel some of these new efforts across the country into the federal funding like Fed State Partnership and Chrissy Grants moving into the future. Um, we are working through our service development plan. So all of that is uh, to say we are gearing up in order to do big asks. Like for example, we're gonna, the state is probably going to ask for around, I think, Four, five, maybe even six hundred million dollars for safety uh, improvements along the BN line for the northern portion, the um, positive train control on that. So that will be one opportunity for federal dollars. And then once we get through our planning process and we get closer into the environmental clearance in NEPA, we'll and, and in negotiations with the railroads, we'll have a better idea of the infrastructure costs, and then we'll be able to leverage the corridor ID position where the district is and the collaboration that we've had with the state towards a Fed State Partnership grant. And that is where the federal dollars for helping develop the capital construction for the infrastructure will be coming from. So that's another opportunity there. As of now, no federal dollars have been committed um, to the project yet. The, the single grant is for developing the service development plan? We got a grant uh, from in the past, a Chrissy grant for the service development plan. And then there's also a new program, the Corridor Identification Development Program, CIDP. And that is a program that helps us funnel through the planning process that FRA created. They basically recognized with the passage of IIJA and the billions of dollars that were dedicated for the passenger rail around the country, how are they going to distribute those funds when they've never done that before? So one of the opportunities they created was this CIDP, and then corridors such as the Front Range Passenger Rail can go through three separate steps. And once you get through the third step, you're eligible for these uh, federal state partnership dollars that are able to develop the and pay for the, the infrastructure. I will note that the district was uh, one of two corridors nationwide to be accepted in the corridor identification program on step two. So that puts us a little bit ahead and a little bit closer to realizing those federal dollars in the future. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, <clears throat> looking towards the future and in very general terms, what percentage mix do you see of federal funding, um, state funding through the measures that you discussed earlier, and uh, sales tax revenues? How do those three funding sources compare yeah. in, in terms of amounts? Yeah, I would say realistically when we're looking at a, a project that's going to cost $3 billion and change, the majority of the, the funding will come from the sales tax revenue. We may get half a billion billion dollars from the feds that would be good mm -hmm. that's what we'll be shooting for but i think that would be around the ceiling of what we would get and then the the bulk of the rest of it i think will come from the sales tax dollars and then those dollars um a couple of things the 230 dollars uh, as well as the 184 dollars because we're able to leverage those you know if we pass a ballot measure we can leverage those in order to get you know better um, value of those the 230 dollars are also kind of exciting too because with the local governments we're able to as we mentioned before kind of that connectivity planning around the station building the connectivity so whether or not the district gets those dollars or your transit agency gets those we're still going to be getting value from those dollars for this project in order to develop the connectivity to the station because we'll be a part of that conversation if that makes sense mm-hmm and you, you've talked about coordinating with uh, 
Northwest Rail. Would Front Range Passenger Rail and RTD run separate train sets on those same uh, freight tracks uh, to achieve both those purposes? My personal hope is no. I would hope that we're able to get a joint operations for one train set that's able to do a local stop and then at other times do an express stop because two sets of trains if I'm running my own set of trains and then RTD is running their own set of trains, that increases the traffic and that's going to be even more difficult to negotiate with BNSF around integrating into what the freight traffic is. So I would argue not only does that increase our opportunities for better service, right, and more frequent service with one joint train operating, but then we can also leverage the dollars that we're going to have from the from the taxpayers on maintenance facilities, operation agreements, and leveraging those as joint operations up north makes a better value. Okay, uh, one final question: Is Amtrak involved in this project at all? Very much so. They're on they're on the district's board. Uh, they're very interested in providing service for this corridor, very interested, and they would love to be the, the rail provider for this service. All right, so this might be an Amtrak route. Mm -hmm. It could be an Amtrak route, and they bring that statutory authority to be able to travel the, uh, the tr their trains on the freight railroads, which no other rail provider has. Um, they have the opportunity and, and the, the history of working with the, uh, rail the railroads, as well as having done this all around the country. Mm -hmm. They also have a history of working commuter rail and passenger rail together along certain corridors and then going into you know just a passenger rail and or commuter rail in the future um, or in a different area. So those are some of those benefits. Some of the some of the challenges with Amtrak are the state supported services, right? We get an Amtrak train that looks like an Amtrak train. And if we want to put the Front Range Passenger Rail logo on there, that's a little bit more money. If we want to do a push cart with micro beers from Colorado, a little bit more money, right? And so we customize the service that we need to, but it's going to cost us a little more. They also have the liability that can cover a lot of what, you know, passenger rail needs. And it's actually interesting if we do a different, um, operator non Amtrak their liability will have to be at the Amtrak level because Amtrak is kind of the industry standard for operating passenger rails so I know that's probably more than you needed to know I apologize right. well, thank you very much yeah you're welcome um you've done a great job <laughs> thanks so far um I have a question <laughs> so far that, that was right. <laughs> um a lot of my colleagues covered like a lot of the numbers, so I just have a few questions about specifically that QR code you showed at the end. Yes. That's for anybody to take, right? Absolutely, yeah. Is there a window for this for people? And then what's the district going to do with that data? That helps inform kind of what we want to build into our conversations uh, in the planning process and when we communicate to the public around what kind of service will be available. It's an exciting opportunity now to develop the service based off of input that we get from the constituents as opposed to expanding an existing line and we only have limited choices type thing. Gotcha. Um, is this like available as a poster or flyer because I know like posting this would get people's attention. Yeah, absolutely. We have we have a little train tickets that we do bring in. Uh, did we bring any? I don't have that many. We can easily get more to you. Mm -hmm. And then also, I mean, any PIOs you can hit us with to distribute the mailing list, we'd love to do it. But mm -hmm. I, have, I have eight, so the more are available. You can ask Phil and he, I can ask you for Phil. Yeah, perfect. I was actually going to talk about that as well, kind of. Um, I don't know about you all, but I miss like having tickets like physical things and I don't know the logistics I'm just an ideas person but actually having physical tickets makes an experience more yeah. real you have memories tied to an actual object so if somehow we could have actual tickets be available to purchase and used for the for this that'd be great that'd be cool yeah that'd thank you cool. I don't have any other questions All right, I just got one. As as uh, council uh, board member Kim said, we've kind of covered so many questions here, um, and with the QR codes in re regards to that and the ticket, um, I I'm curious about 
how are you essentially calculating demand right now for ridership? And how are you really going to reach the folks that you honestly need to reach? Yeah. Number one, for the, the 23 cent sales tax uh, to the disgruntled fast tracks, yeah. northern Colorado yeah. voter. Yeah. So I'm just curious in regards to that type of outreach, and is there any strategy around how you are going to be able to do this, as well as then, of course, what is the demand going to be? Yes. So in regards to the demand and the modeling, again, I apologize. We haven't gotten through that with the planning yet, and CDOT is the responsible. They're doing the planning and the modeling and all that, so they would be able to answer your question on how they are coming up with that ridership modeling and, and the demand. Um, with the outreach and those conversations, um, as I mentioned before, I think that there's a real opportunity, a couple of opportunities. One, with the uh, Senate Bill 184 joint operation conversation this summer, we have an opportunity to utilize the, uh, and expand upon the outreach that RTD has done with the peak period study and utilize some of the key uh, kind of stakeholders and, and champions that they've identified um, through that study process, build into that and expand upon that and utilize those same folks, bring them into the 184 conversation so that this joint operation collaboration narrative begins to take hold and it's not a one or the other type, uh, you know, binary choice. It's more of a, you know, win-win scenario. So that would be one. And then we have a budget and we have gone through our, uh, uh, we've got some consultants on our uh, consultant bench that will be doing outreach uh, and we are developing those target uh, audiences and talking points and strategies as we speak. The board of directors and the governor are making a go, no go decision on whether or not to go to the ballot, probably in a week or two. And by the end of this month, the board of directors uh, for the district will have that in mind. And so if they decide to go in 24, that's one strategy. And that timeline for outreach is going to be X. If we go in 26, different strategy in that timeline, obviously, is going to be a little bit longer. Thank you. Um, man, all our, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, thank you for answering all of these hard questions. Um, I wish my mayor was, our mayor was here tonight because I know she would have a lot of mayor questions. Mayor Peck? Yeah. She's on my board. She's on your board. She's on the board. Yeah, she, she is awesome. I don't, yeah, of course she is. She's from Longmont. Um, <laughs> well, I think one of the things that, so when did uh, Senate Bill 230 pass? It passed just right in the very end of this session. Okay. Literally last week, I think, right? Right. And so, um, so who all, like Governor Polis, of course, uh, was an advocate for it, and do we know who else? Uh, how did all of that, like, at the last minute come about? Yeah, yeah, it wasn't the, you know, obviously at the last minute when everything came together, it was a lot of transit agencies, and having worked in government affairs for many years prior to this job, that narrative around operating funds for transit agencies in Colorado, how do you establish those connections, what is the funding available for that through our state budget, That was, it's been Let's put that there. Well, that's been ongoing, you know, through through many different legislative sessions. So I think the impetus with Governor Polis wanting to do something prior before him leaving the his office mm -hmm. definitely wants to have Fort Reach passenger rail as kind of his legacy before he leaves. So that was a big impetus where that political capital came in to the building under the dome that had been lacking before in order to kind of coalesce, plus with the Senate president being from Boulder, that helped. And then the transit agencies in Casta and Coburg and others really kind of worked behind the scenes with the state legislature and the governor's office in order to make that happen. That's my understanding of the process. Awesome, okay. Um, I know one of the questions, I don't know, Phil, you may know. Um, one of the questions I know Mayor Peck wanted to know, do we know if RTD, um, how, do, do we know how they will fa uh, finance fast tracks? Mm. No. 
very good. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, we're not sure how RTD is going to finance fast tracks beyond the sales tax that they already have out there. So that's what we know right now, but they're going to be using, I mean, their idea is to use some of those savings account dollars as well. So it's going to have to be that negotiation that Andy was talking about earlier, how they talk to each other and where those dollars go and how they can set the system up for success rather than being kind of like, like you did say before about the two systems that kind of have to sh share trackage and, and maybe operate in slightly different realms. And so uh, we don't have a good number. We don't have a good date, quite frankly. I mean, we've been told 2042, it keeps getting pushed out. Uh. They're trying to do three trains per day or tr three round trips. Well, three trains in in the morning and three trains back in their peak service study. And so that's all we know right now is that they're trying to figure out a way to just study that and get the dollars that they need. They don't even know how much that's going to cost yet and that they're going through Burlington Northern or BNSF right now to get those costs down and get BNSF to settle on a cost that that will be. And then they can start having a target to hit. So that's where they're at right now. So we're not, we're not close, quite frankly. But there are some dollars here that are for RTD. Uh, so that might have moved it a little closer, which is nice. And so we'll keep working on that. There's, there's also uh, language in the legislation in Senate Bill 230 and 184 about the prioritization of Northwest Rail and continuing to make that crystal clear to RTD and to the district that the northern uh, portion of this corridor in Northwest Rail is a priority and that it should continue to be a priority. One additional thing that what Phil was saying for these fast track savings account dollars, it's an interesting dynamic to see if we will be able to leverage those for some of these Federal Rail Administration dollars, right? Because if we are, that $90 million or whatever of the FISA dollars that are dedicated for the for, for, uh, Northwest Rail, we can leverage those at a very aggressive uh, rate for drawing down federal money. Like, for example, through that Corridor ID Development Program, CIDP program that the district's part of, that matching level is 10, nine to, nine, uh, 10 to uh, come, what am I saying? Nine to one, nine to one. So if we come up with a million dollars, they're going to come up with nine million. So there's a real opportunity for us to leverage a lot of these existing dollars with RTD in order to maximize the, the some federal funding that could come down. So that's another opportunity, and that's why I say that. Okay, great. Um, I was a little confused, and I didn't write everything down because probably because I was confused. Um, when you mentioned, I think you were talking about the CIDP, and um, you were you were also mentioning something about we wouldn't be able to. It had never been done before as far as distributing federal funds to each city or uh, each m municipality. Uh, what do you actually mean by that? Because. Do you remember saying something like that? I was a little confused. Why are you yeah. laughing, Phil, at me? <laughs> no, 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 I think I'm just, I'm no, just no. want to know because when you said that, it triggered something with me because we had a pandemic we went through, and all the municipalities who got federal funding had to distribute that money, money that they had never had to do before. So for me, that's no excuse. They need to figure it out like we did during the pandemic. So. What does I, I just I guess I'm asking what is what do you mean that yeah. they never did that before? So yeah, so when the uh, IIJA passed at the federal level, and that's a big I don't know if you remember that or not, but it was maybe five years ago now. Big federal transportation funding bill at the federal level passed. Even within that bill, there was sixty plus billion dollars for rail programs, some existing rail programs like in Northeast Corridor, uh, some going to Amtrak, some coming to new programs like what we're talking about in the Front Range. That money, those billions and billions of dollars with FRA, with the Federal Rail Administration, traditionally that administration, that body was not a grant-making body. They had a few grants that they would do. They never had this much money and they've never dealt with this many new corridors coming online. That's historic. Mm -hmm. So that's where I was referring to this new, uh, the, the federal agency, the Federal Rail Administration, 
was unused to distributing out this level of funding to so many different possible entities, especially new ones like myself, through this corridor ID program. They were used to delivering it to Amtrak, to shovel ready programs, established you know corridors and all that. But with this conversation of new passenger rail, that being new, similar to in Colorado with the state you know legislation that passed, those enterprises are gonna have to come up with a grant formula and a, a funding strategy in order to figure out how to distribute those funds. The feds had to do that, you know, FRA had to do that with these billions and billions of dollars. And they've been slow doing it. And there was actually um, some news articles today talking about the challenges, the political challenges the administration is seeing because these dollars haven't got out quickly. And now there's some political ramifications to that. I was afraid that's what you were going to say. Um, I could say something different just to make it better. I'm just joking. As long as it won't bite you in the butt later, no, no, then no, yeah, no, okay. No, so, <laughs> no um, I, you know, I hear you keep saying you hope, you hope, you hope, you hope, you hope. And I think we're beyond hope right now. And um, it's just that why can't we get consultants to help them out? We get consultants for absolutely everything else. Uh, we need to get consultants to help them to learn how to distribute this money to all of the new um, entities that are out here. I, I don't know. In you saying 40%, maybe we'll have it on the ballot. You know, um, I mean, people already know the situation as far as the rail and everything. I think the main thing is getting this QR code out ASAP and. Um, we need to get hustling and moving. I mean, as soon as possible, like how many years ago? And um, I don't know, I just keep feeling like excuses, excuses, excuses. I'm not directing this to you. No, I hear you. I, I you know what I'm saying? I understand, yeah. yeah. I, I feel the same, I, I, I understand. Yeah, and then I thought we had, before correct me if I'm wrong, cause you, you know I'm all over the place. But I remember that we were talking about, or was it RTD, we're saying that it would be good if we had the train on the same line because it would be less expensive. I do agree. I like to make sure that we have good value and not have to go back and, refit and redo something. But if it means that we could be on the same, yeah. you know, share the train or to share the line to get us going, yeah. I mean, I think we may all be happy with that in the beginning yeah. and then, you know, work on it as we go. Um, so I get what you were saying about the value and be able to have our microbrewery beer on there, whatever we want to do with it. That's what Amtrak, I know. But wouldn't it make sense to get it going if we can? Yes, 1,000%. And that, that is what we work for every day. The challenge, and, and I, I hear your frustration, and I feel that frustration as well. I know the planning efforts are not fast. Working with the railroads, it's not fast. You know, getting funding is not fast. Developing a campaign, unfortunately, is not fast. I, I would run a campaign tomorrow if I had the money and the district could do it. But, you know, it's interesting with our governor being so involved and, and, and excited about this project, he's that political capital. And, and I, I liken it to um, New Mexico, where they have a similar service down in New Mexico. They didn't use any federal dollars. Utah didn't use any federal dollars. I'm saying that out loud, and I'm not even sure if that's true. I'm pretty sure Utah didn't use any federal dollars, and they were able to make this happen very quickly. We don't have that luxury in Colorado. We have to use federal dollars. Hmm. And that's the unfortunate truth, because we can't do that, that state support up front like every other state in this country can. Our state legislature can't dedicate hundreds of millions of dollars in order to, to, to buy access. Then we'll be able to get trains running. But if we can't get the access agreements with the railroads quickly, and utilizing our state dollars in order to make that happen, we need to use the Fed dollars and we need to go through the Fed planning process. And you talk about consultants at the federal level helping them out. I'm on my third consultant right now in the corridor ID program, right? And I was accepted in December last year. 
three consultants so far to try and have that conversation, cycling through them. They're hiring tons of consultants, but it's just, there's so many people out there and there's so much money to distribute that they're underwater. It's I mean, tough. you need more consultants? Because I can see you have an email of several consultants that... We don't know. need more consultants. We just need a, a more efficient planning process. Okay. Okay. And how long have you all been doing the service development plan? It got underway... I want to say right around the, it was right around the time the district became a thing, so uh, July 1st, 2022. And we expect it to be done near the end of next year. Okay. And how's that going? It's going. Oh, that's not a good answer. Okay. I'm just trying to figure out what can we do to make sure that we are as efficient as possible and not having this conversation two years from now. Yeah. I think what we can do and be more efficient is continue to collaborate with RTD around a joint operations and work on becoming as efficient as possible for Northwest Rail because that is the opportunity that we've got right in front of us. Not to the detriment of the southern portion of the district. That will continue on and we will continue to be developing that. But in reality, just because of the facts of where we are, you know, probably the most efficient process for us is to continue to develop that relationship with RTD and communicate to our constituents that's the case and this is the that's the most official way moving forward okay um almost done you're fine um so what do we do how do we prepare each city of all these stops i mean we are headed again as you said but how do we prepare them to be ready to go? Yeah. It, because when that ballot is passed, yeah. um, we need people to be ready, right? We need Pueblo, Pueblo to be ready. We need everybody to be ready. Yeah. Um, not just Longmont. We don't mind just having the train come here and leave and take <laughs> us to where we want to go. But we need everyone else to be ready. Um, so how are we preparing the, everyone else to be ready? Yeah. And to, you know, that's very important because that's that itself, within itself, will slow us down. Yep. And that's what I see mostly as my job, right? As we get towards this ballot measure, how do we prepare the local governments and the cities and the municipalities along this corridor to be ready? A um, couple of answers. Many of them are on my board, on the district's board. So the MPOs are all represented on the district's board. And so all of the transit planning, all of the conversations at the MPO level are relevant to what we're doing. I update the MPOs annually. Um, so there's a, an existing relationship and, and collaboration at that. Also with RTD um, as well and CDOT. Uh, we also have local government electeds uh, on, my, on the board that can communicate out to their constituents. I think the 184 conversations that we're going to have this summer will start those conversations and establish a core group in order to develop that common understanding moving forward. Right now we've got this kind of disparate set of facts on peak period study wants to do this, service development plan wants to do this, this happened in the past, this may happen in the future. Let's get all of that together and develop the common set of understanding so that we can develop the narrative and have conversations with constituents so that it's not a conflicting message from RTD or from the district. Um, the outreach budget that uh, and the, cons the consultants that I have, we're developing that strategy around that. It's at the state or it's at the local, state, and federal level because we're going to have to communicate on all of those levels in order to make this happen, right? I, th I personally think the most important one is at the local level, mm -hmm. but of course we have to continue to work at the federal level in order for that to trickle down and make it happen. Um, those are some of the things that, and, and I could go on around, you know, kind of outreach and the, the grass tops or the grassroots and developing our champions and our core group. You are right, and we are working to create that common understanding as, and so that we are ready. Another thing is with station area planning, a lot of this conversation is somewhat removed from municipalities because it's the track outside of the municipality or it's the speeds or service or whatnot. Hmm. 
but the station is something that you all will have as a tangible benefit and value, a capital something that you can touch where the train will land and your citizens will get on and off. So that is where we are focusing our attention now with those nine primary stations along that corridor and we're having conversations with them in order to accept like you guys are, uh, I'll just say on like step 10, or what, I don't even know how some steps are, I'm just making this up. But you know, you're not on step one. Colorado Springs is on step three. You know, so it, it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic to try and get everybody on that level playing field as well. And we probably won't have everybody on that same level when we get to a ballot measure. But what we hope to have is that common understanding of that, even if you don't have a station there and you're not ready for it, you know what's coming and you can communicate that out to your citizens and it's not something new. I hope that helped answer your question. Also, council member, we're sharing our information with these other cities so that to bring them further along faster and just kind of lessons learned and those kind of things, as well as stepping back from some of these federal grants and let the folks that are not as far along insert themselves into those federal grant programs and step back a little bit, but still provide all our information. Well, they need to be hiring you all as consultants. No, I'm, I'm serious. I'm not even joking because you all are doing it. You, you're getting money and you're actually doing the work. And so um, our staff need to be consultants. You can, I'm not saying you can't just give free information, but everything comes with the cost. Or you need to take Phil with you to, uh, to BNSF and ask for some money. I mean, I don't understand. I'll take you with you, absolutely. <laughs> I'll take you with me as well. Uh, yeah, hey, don't, don't, don't tempt me. I'll be going with you for real. Um, <laughs> but, um, okay, well, I'm just, I know you keep saying hope, 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 but, I, I mean, I just don't see us, I don't see it being on a ballot measure uh, ballot this year. Um, and then for us to have to wait for two years, I think the longer we wait, the less hope there is, although we've been trying to be strategic, but we haven't been strategic in the last few years. We're still working on this development plan, and we have hunting of however many consultants and stuff still ain't ready or done. I mean, keep waiting and keep waiting year after year after year. I don't know what's the result that besides time has passed. So I think we need to see some results. Am I right, y'all? Okay. I just want to make sure I'm not by myself over no, here. No, and I'm not, like, upset at you. No, I'm not taking it that way. No. Okay, good. No, no. I just want to make sure. No, Do I no, need to I, get I, you some more water or no, something? No, no, I okay. appreciate it. I, I would say, you know, one major result that we can point to to the public was the creation of the district. That in and of itself is a major milestone for the state because okay. we have the ability. We, when a ballot measure passes, we'll have the tax base in order to pay for a ballot or a, for a project. We will have the authority in order to do what we need to do in order to pay for a project. And I say this because it's an independent district in order to deliver the project, not a state that is dependent upon a political leadership or political appointees, which in some states has led to you know challenges and difficulties. Or it's not a separate entity like a joint power authority that's got a bunch of authority but then gets bogged down because of whatever happens. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that we can talk to. Another one is, uh, truly are these pieces of legislation that did pass, and I unjustly and unfairly said, you know, it's kind of much more focused in, onto the future, like step 50 and we're on step two. While that may be the case, that is a clear indication to the FRA as well as to the constituents, as well as to the railroads and to Amtrak that our state is serious even under the constraints that we find ourselves under Tabor, that we are serious and we are finding ways to make that happen. So that's another success. Does that go far enough with the, with the public? Not at all, we gotta keep working on it and we gotta keep moving like you said, but we have had some serious uh, successes and I do think that RTD wants to, someone was talking about, a, I think it was you sir, a, a, a service in the past that, that uh, some other entity wanted to get off their backs because it was dragging them down and they should, maybe I, this is a conversation that I had earlier. <laughs> Y'all are looking at me like, I didn't say anything like that. I'm having too many conversations. Um, but in any case, I think RTD wants to be able to focus on the service that RTD 
RTD provides and less on this baggage of Northwest Rail. So there's another opportunity with 184 where there's a true opportunity for collaboration with some possible dollars associated with it to move into the future too. So is it moving fast enough? No. But are we moving? Yeah, we are. I hope that helps. Thank you. You're welcome. Great, thank you very much for the presentation. Yeah. I think we've taken up enough time. Oh, I was just getting warmed up. I know. All right. <laughs> thank you all very much. I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Speaking and dining, or was it dining and dashing? Speaking and dashing. They'd like to take the train back to Denver, but they. <laughs> yeah, there's no in five years there. they will. <laughs> Definitely will. Thank you for being here tonight. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for hosting us. And we'll come back anytime that you want to. Thank you. Phil, you want to move on to the um, action item uh, seven? Yeah. Good evening. Again, we'll just run right into this action item. It's pretty simple. I think it's pretty straightforward. We actually do have another volunteer. So Gina has volunteered to be on the uh, selection committee, I believe. Correct? Maybe not. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting shakes of the head. So uh, we're trying to put together interviews now. Taylor and, uh, well, excuse me, board member Wicklin and board member McKee Burroughs have both decided to uh, be part of that. And I know two of our typical interviewers are going to be part of the actual interview. Our interv interviewees are becoming the interviewer, other way around. Um, they usually do the other side of this. So tonight we just ask that you uh, consider both board member Wickland and board member McKee Burroughs as your representatives to interview the uh, five. There's five folks that are applying for the TAB positions, two of which are on your board already. We need a motion and a second. Do we need to do a, a motion yeah, for that? Yeah, let's do okay. the official All right. thing. We need a motion to approve um, board member Burroughs and Wickland. We don't have to do that, right? Oh, we do. Okay. So uh, a motion to approve th them uh, doing the interviewing of the five candidates. So can I get a, oh, I do have one. There you go. Wait, is that a second? Or do I do the motion? Okay, so a motion to uh, have McKee Burroughs and Wickland as the uh, selection committee for um, TAB interviewees. And I'll second that motion. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, it passes. Okay, and we'll, um, I think we can wrap up with uh, comments from board members, and we'll start with uh, board member Kim, and go this way this time. How's that? Um, did they leave those tickets? Cool. I want one. And, <laughs> oh, I can't wait. <laughs> Thank you. Um, other than that, no, no other comments. This was a really informative night. I appreciated the conversation, the questions everyone brought, and I look forward to next meeting. Um, if it gets moved to, I'm okay with that. Yeah, it was a very interesting um, evening. Great to have that presentation. So thanks to staff for bringing the Front Range Passenger Rail uh, representatives to our board. And uh, I hope that we can continue to stay up to date with these very important uh, rail transit initiatives. Thank you. Um, I just want to acknowledge uh, Longmont for being so far ahead of every other city in making rail and you know transit in general much more reality than almost every other place. And I think that that really deserves like you know round of applause that the city a city here are doing such a good job of ma moving things forward. <laughs> 
So just real quick, one of the reasons we're so far ahead is because of fast tracks that passed in 2004. And so we started seeing that we better start planning for our station. And that's what kind of put us ahead of the rest of the group is just waiting 20 years for a fast track <laughs> or waiting 20 years for a train. So it's not all, it, it, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I think we just need to you know, acknowledge that. Yeah. So thank you. Well, uh, as always, it's fun to talk about rail for the last 20 years since I was 14. So, um, the, the the only thing I do want to, a uh, couple things I do want to bring up. Uh, one's kind of a question, but uh, uh, commend the staff for putting up those jersey barriers by the hotel because I kept seeing a lot of people walking uh, there as well. So, don't know whose decision that was. <laughs> Uh, and, and I hope maybe we're maybe looking at maybe doing some studies of what we could do elsewhere to narrow roadways down um, and see the actual impact of through traffic. Uh, and then the other thing I, I am just curious about is because I, the, this kind of popped in my head today. I was at uh, a council study session over a year ago related to kind of 287 downtown corridor uh, where, where I work and I'm just wondering if there's been any uh, conversations about um, with CDOT if they're even willing to have a conversation. Uh, Wicklin, um to date, we have not had conversations with CDOT. It is no. still on our radar. We've been coordinating with LDDA on that. Um, we're looking to have something going on uh, in the near future, yeah. uh, but we are still looking at it. All right, cool. You know, I, I'm, I'm always excited for any future thinking, so. All right, th thank you for a good evening. Yes, this was exciting. I, uh, at first, I wasn't sure if I was going to make it, and then I looked at the agenda, and I'm like, oh, I must make it. So uh, glad I did. And uh, I commend Mayor Peck for being on the Front Range Passenger Rail Board, and I uh, hope that she is in clear and constant communication with, um, with you, Phil, and in any updates as they arise. Um, and uh, yes, I also look forward to having tacos and talking about my love for public transportation on May 30th at the Senior Center. Yeah, thank you to staff for uh, bringing the Front Range uh, Passenger Rail folks here um, and the explanation and the information I think was pretty valuable. Um, I, I guess my only comment beyond that is it seems fairly political in regards to how this is kind of getting put together. And I know that there's a, a, a lot of momentum from the governor on down. And I hope we, we look at the more the need and the critical need for some of this as opposed to politically what's expedient, what's going to work, that sort of a thing, right? Because it seems like you can cut corners that way. Um, but other than that, I think it was a good night. Um, yeah. So thank you. Items from the next agenda, it looks like we're going to do the CIP update um, on the June meeting. Is that correct? Oh. No worries. I've been very vocal tonight. I know. Um, <laughs> I just want to say uh, thank you again to staff for all you do. And although it's taken all this time and we are prepared, you all put forth the effort to be prepared today and you were very strategic so that matters um, other cities are not prepared for it although they've been waiting for it but you all took action so that means a lot um, and I just want to say thank you for that and um, and I don't know if we recorded this but he said call him back at any time so we can call them back anytime and um, and how do we get to the point like New Mexico and Utah, where they didn't have to have federal funding? I think a lot of what he was trying to say was Tabor is kind of the big issue. But that's it. Okay. 
Well, I can I can turn a little bit. In Utah, um, UDOT um, funds differently and is funded differently, and they actually run a surplus, UDOT does. So I know that there's just more money in general, at least in the state of Utah, around transportation and, and new ideas because it's available to them. Awesome. Okay. Well, I just want to say thank you. And my apologies for overlooking Council Member Yarbrough on that last comment. Um, so the items for the upcoming agenda looks like the 2024 CIP update, correct, for June? Correct. We do have that on for June, and okay. people are, will be here. So Anything else? We think that's probably going to be a full evening. I think we're going to be talking about microtransit as well. Okay. Uh, we're very, very close to selecting a vendor on that project, so we want to come back and talk to you a little bit more about that, give you an update, talk to you maybe more about parking. Um, and let and give you some updates on that as well. So there's a few things that'll be coming up, but we'll keep you apprised of all that uh, in your next agenda. Great, thank you. So um, I think we have concluded. So if we can get a motion to adjourn, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn this meeting. I'd like to second that motion. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? No? Great.